Hello everyone, welcome to Snap Take. This is Glazer of Snap Judgments, the official podcast of Marvel Snap Zone. Let's get excited. We've got three great decks for you. We've got a big breakdown of extra patch notes stuff. We've got a look at nine cost cards, which are suddenly a really key point in Marvel Snap, and so much more. Let's go. Before we get started, I'd like to invite you to sub every single weekday, and usually on Sundays we bring you at least two often three, sometimes 20, brand new decks, proven decks that can help you get to infinite, can help you get those infinity borders, can help you achieve all your goals in and around Marvel Snap. Please hit that sub button, free to you, really helps us out. We also do shop guides and everything else you can need. If you want 20 decks that are new from after yesterday's OTA, check yesterday afternoon's video. I believe it's 24 decks with the adjusted cards. We are looking for a giveaway winner. We're looking for Enoch Lee. If you are this person, please email me at snapjustinspodcast at gmail.com. Our three decks for today are, we have The Pirate King himself, a deck from Tucker with the 75% win rate. That's the one that probably got you to click on the title. We've got The Human Spider, one of the top tournament players in the world, a largely free-to-play player, just by the way, um, who hit number four rank with this cool Thanos Sandman brew. And then we've got the guest on this week's snap judgments podcast z z was absolutely amazing you can find that over on the marvel snaps on youtube so make sure you check it out i'm going to throw it in the show notes it always ends up in the show notes so make sure you check z out z has a really really cool brew um z doesn't usually build decks she talks about not usually building decks on the podcast but she was inspired so i'll look she's inspired i played the decks the decks are great in between the decks, we're going to talk about the notes that went with the OTA. We did the decks. We reviewed the cards yesterday. We're going to talk about the notes and what they tell us about the game. And then we're going to take a look at nine power cards. And finally, we'll finish up with a look at the shop. Let's keep it going. Our first deck is Tucker's Trust. He has named this deck Trust. I don't know why. Full name. Either way, though. I like it. Um, This deck is fundamentally built around getting Ms. Marvel in the middle, getting Doom or Spectrum to spread out a bunch of power thereafter, and winning. Jean Grey is so unbelievably good here, both with Negasonic and with um, keeping uh, making the opponent play things on top of Echo. Um, if you can get that filled relatively early, for example, um, you can do something like Nebula, Echo, Jean, And then you can drop like an Iron Ladder or a Super Scroll there that's now a full location. You don't have to do that in the mid if you realize that you have a bunch of low-cost cards in hand, right? As soon as you realize that you have a bunch of low-cost cards in hand, doing that on the left or the right will royally screw up your opponents, especially as everyone is playing such high-cost cards right now. Echo is unbelievable right now. You can also just do that in the middle, drop Ms. Marvel on top of Jean Grey, call it a day, and then spread out through the board with either Doom or Spectrum. That Doom makes Ms. Marvel even, uh, sorry, makes Jean even really a good turn five play with a card like Jeff. You move Jeff, they are forced to play in the spot you want on the last turn, and at that point you can drop your Doom, spread power out, drop your Spectrum to spread a bunch of power out, even right on that Jean, getting power every will they get. If you need to go tall in that lane, well, that's what Iron Man is for. And Negasonic tells them to please not bother you so much while you're there. Cool. Nebula can be Sunspot or Iceman. Both are significantly worse. One of the beautiful things about Nebula, her real secret power, is forcing your opponent to play where you want to compete, where you want her to give you free power. Echo is really hard to replace. You can do a lot of things from Iceman to Cosmos to Enchantress, but both Echo and, I didn't write her, but Echo and Jean feel very necessary for this version. It's what makes this version this version of the deck. Um, I didn't write like a few of these. Jeff can be Nightcrawler as usual. You're going to need Zabu and you need Jubilee for Iron Lad. Excuse me. Negasonic is probably also not replaceable. Juggernaut is what you'd usually replace Negasonic with, and it just does something totally different in this deck because you're not trying to lock a lane down with Gene and force them to keep playing there. You're trying to remove a threat as they try and do something powerful. Negasonic hits them as Marvel. Negasonic hits whatever. All of a sudden, the opponent has to run. You've won the game. Negasonic is absolutely stellar in a Ms. Marvel meta where the opponent has to play in the middle. If they do get their Ms. Marvel down, you can always super scroll right there. All right. Uh, this has a 75% win rate so far. Um, 
How many games is it? It is 57 games. That's a reasonable sample, especially for one person. Turn one, Nebula is greater than Echo, generally speaking, unless I have Gene or Marvel. If I have Gene or Marvel, I reverse that order. Turn two, uh, Zabu is better than Nebula, is better than Echo, is better than Jeff, is my general order. Jeff is nice later as like a part of a two card play, or you can, even if you have Gene out, you can play Jeff wherever you want. And then if you play a second card, you could also play that second card wherever you want, which is really nice. Turn three, Gene is generally my goal, even if I have Zabu down. Um, Zabu's beauty is for later in the game where he, where it lets me double spell either on turn um, five or turn six, where I can play a three and then another card. Turn four, generally speaking, is Marvel's priority over Lad over Super Scroll, but all of that depends on what the opponent has. If the opponent, um, if you know you have Doom in deck, for example, um, or you know you haven't hit Zabu and you're looking for Zabu, or you know they're playing a um, ongoing deck and you haven't hit Echo yet, then it's a reasonable idea to pump Lad over Ms. Marvel, right? If you know they're going wildly ongoing, and that means they're not running Spectrum, but like they're this is clearly like a Dino deck with everything else in it, all the accoutrement, then Super Scroll takes priority. Whatever is the most important, because Ms. Marvel's basically like a secondary Doom. Uh, turn 5, you're usually going to play a 4. For three, ideally with Zebu, and a two or one. Iron Man obviously also works if you need to go tall. Um, I'm a little nervous about Rogue so with Iron Man. I haven't seen it. It has happened to me a little bit, but maybe I just still have a little bit of Rogue PTSD. And then turn six, we've got Doom or Spectrum. Oh, do the math. Read how much power they're going to add, and please choose correctly. Um, the extra power on Spectrum could be important, but... And that, like, the extra power on Spectrum, there's often two ongoing cards, so it's one less power in the lane, two more on her. So you're going to have to do some counting and checking. All right, quick variant talk. I need an Echo. I don't want to talk about it. I really want the um, Echo in the featured shop this month. We'll see if we get there. Luckily, though, this is a five-hip deck. We've got Nebula, Zabu, Jeff. Six-hip deck, big time. Iron Lad, Spectrum, and the newest hip in my collection, Iron Man. You love to see it. We... um. I will get this Ms. Marvel once I finish the um, season mission. Happy to have it. Midnight Suns Jean Grey is one of my favorite Jean Greys. I luckily have had this Negasonic for quite a while. There are very few Negasonic variants at Snap. I let Chibi Super Scroll grows on me more and more, and Emperor Doom remains best Doom. Um, I need an Echo. Let's get me that Echo, and this deck will be absolutely Next up, we're going to talk some OTA notes. So next, we know that OTAs can now change under fields to ongoings, so they can do more, but Second Dinner, Glenn at least, is not planning to use that functionality for the time being. I think that's important to note because should they release another Loki, we now know that they can fix it on a week's notice. It no longer has to wait for a patch, which changes our expectations when they break something in-game. Does that lead to them being bolder? I would assume not based on things on the next slide that we'll get to. Cool. Next up, they want Mobius to be like Cosmo, both play rate and power level, um, but Mobius hits every lane and Cosmo only hits his lane, so Mobius is more powerful. They say that's why they didn't make Mobius a 3-4, which seems silly to me because Cosmo is a 3-3 and they just said Mobius is more powerful. Uh, Mobius as a 3-2 I think would be perfectly fine. Um, Cosmo does something to the board though and mobius does something to your hand that later affects the board and i think that's also a reasonable difference i understand the comparison it's a comparison i've made over what you play in a deck now when i saw the mobius change but i don't love it from a like goal for mobius perspective they did tell us what the mobius backup plan is uh the mobius backup plan is two three and then on turn six it, its ability takes effect so it's basically like leech it's not an unreveal that's a fine card i guess um, that's mostly like a Sarah counter, right? I guess, it, um, because you're like playing She-Hulk on turn seven, right? Like you're playing She-Hulk on turn seven with your magic style cards. So that's not affected. Um, you could just play death a turn earlier most of the time. I don't know. I think it's probably a more interesting card with the change than it is as an ongoing. So I'd like to see it, but we shall see. Next up. It's nice to get this actually confirmed. Chang-Chi's play rate is and was through the roof, but its metrics have always been average. 
So the change is about 10 being a better number than nine and that opening up some design space, but it's very hard not to see this as power creep. Saying that like we should make this more powerful so we can make more powerful cards, so we can punish more powerful cards. We're going to talk about exactly what cards immediately get better with this Shang change, but I do think that this is a very significant change for the metagame. And we're going to be feeling the ripples of it for a while going forward. Next up, oop, I hit two in a row, excuse me. Uh, they basically admit to messing up five cards in a row. So they messed up Loki. They changed him to a four or five. Then, uh, and they keep saying that Loki's numbers, even at the top of ladder, are not like significantly better than anything else. Then the week after Loki, Alioth went was released a six five immediately bumped down to a six three. Then they um release Ravona as a three three immediately, like three weeks later, make her a two one. Mobius, we know the Mobius tale. And then the week after that was Elsa, and Elsa went from a two get two two giving two three to two two giving two. So that's five cards in a row that they messed up. The cards after them have seemingly been fine. But it's worth noting that they think they know why, and what they're going to do is they're going to start season design four weeks earlier, which seems good. Season pass cards are going to receive double their previous playtesting, so they don't release any horrible outliers anymore. That seems very good. Um, very few season pass cards have felt just right. It's It's been, there were a lot of underpowered ones in a row. There were a lot of underpowered ones in a row that had to be adjusted upwards. So they need more playtesting. They need to either get some playtesters for these season pass cards or something. Um, everyone's going to remember that the, pa the past two that were busted, uh, Elsa and Loki, but no one's talking about Dokken, Ghost Spider, and Phoenix Force, which, like, Dokken's a fine card, but nothing special, and Phoenix Force and Ghost Spider both had to be basically immediately buffed. Um, I think Ms. Marvel is a happy medium. She's probably a little too strong, but, like, not in a way that breaks the game. I think she's mostly interesting, and the counters to her are very easy to find and play. So, like, okay. Um, they need to figure this out, though, right? Like, the, the card that most people get has to be closer to the mark. Um... Their playtesting methodology will now keep seasons more mixed. Basically, they were playtesting the current meta with a season on top of it instead of testing um, the meta with all the cards up to that point. And they're going to spend additional investment in personnel and resources for balance work. So all these things are good. Are they going to fix everything? They'll help. Um, nothing's going to be fixed, right? Like, nothing is ever going to match several hundred play... Um, content creators, and then several thousand to million players picking up a card and saying, how can we break this immediately on day one? That's always going to be more, I don't know, thorough than anything a company can match. That said, they can get closer. Um, the other explanation they gave is that Mobius uh, hatch change was locked in two weeks before any of the later OTA changes. And that led to, led to a bunch of weirdness because um, they try not to do huge things in patches because, well, they have to be locked in so far. But given what we said about number one on the previous slide, that should matter less going forward because now it, they don't have to make that kind of big change only in a patch. Next up, things they claim. We don't launch cards with a nerf pre-planned pre after a period of time passes. Um, okay, that sounds right. And we don't nerf cards based on their upcoming bundles. That also sounds right. Um, they do clearly at this point boost cards for their bundles. My guess is they keep that to series one, two, and three cards. Fundamentally the free cards of Marvel Snap. This way, like, if you have She-Hulk, buying the She-Hulk bundle doesn't give you... Like, you don't only get a plus one power She-Hulk for buying the bundle, right? Any She-Hulk has that value, so it shouldn't, like, really matter. You just get a prettier variant to play with your plus one power. I think that's a fair way to do it. Um, I honestly don't think they buff and nerf cards based on the bundles. I just, I don't, see, uh, sorry, I don't think they nerf cards based on bundles. Um, I think Mobius released and freaked them out because I think they thought they broke the game. That, that's my closest bet based on what they're saying. Uh, there's like a whole paragraph about how they're pretty sure they broke the game. Okay, to be clear, we will launch cards we think we might need to nerf because game balance is imprecise. We'd rather do that than launch cards we believe will need a buff because the risk is worth ensuring that new cards are meaningful additions to the game. 
fundamentally, one of the major ways that the meta gets shaken up is new cards come out. Some people are going to say that's pay to win, but like, if you don't want a completely stagnant game that kind of has to happen, if you want a game where the meta just stays the same all the time, it's called chess and it exists. The meta is going to adjust, new cards are going to have to be powerful so as to shake up the meta. Is that going to lead to power creep? Second dinner is going to say no. Glenn told us on Snap Judgment specifically no. However, huge, huge, however, every other card game in history shows that there's going to be some level of power creep. I think the Shang-Chi buff shows the same thing. Um, in those cases, we made an earnest and reasonable effort to hit a mark we hope can land and stick, and we're going to work harder on that. And I'm going to be completely clear here. Um, this is where I'm defending second dinner. And, like, if you watch yesterday morning's video, you'll see me rip them a new one about Series 3 completion time and Series drops and how they've created a Catch-22 for themselves. So I'm not chilling for the company. But I, honest to God, cannot think of a card that they've completely killed. I can think of cards they've made not meta, but I just, I've got decks waiting to feature of, um like, 60-plus percent Galactus decks. They didn't kill Galactus. They lowered its win rate. They should probably have lowered Galactus's win rate when it was becoming the meta deck again. Um, they killed Leader, and then as soon as they had an idea how, they went back and fixed him, and now he's a good card again. Is he a meta-defining card? No, but he's still a good card. It's very hard for me to think of cards they've actually nerfed into the ground so that they're just not playable anymore. They're just not good cards that don't belong in some decks anymore. If that's their design philosophy, I'm fine with it, right? Um, Sometimes the meta is going to be to my liking, sometimes it's not. I am enjoying the meta more than I'm not right now, which probably helps the, me in this situation. But like the sh we haven't had a situation in a really long time. It, I mean, some people think Loki is this, but only if you're really high ladder, um, where like Shuri Red Skull dominates the ladder for two and a half straight months. And I'd prefer this to that. And I feel like it kind of has to be one or the other. New cards have to come out that shake up that paradigm. And I'm fine with that, right? Like... Um, if you didn't buy Ms. Marvel this week, it's not like your previous purchases didn't make, made it so you couldn't compete in most of Marvel Snap. That's my take. You're welcome to disagree. I'm sure many in the comments will. That's totally cool. I respect your opinion. Hopefully, you can treat mine with a similar respect. Next up, we have San Thanos. This is the Human Spiders deck. Human Spider is an absolutely brilliant player. This is um a free-to-play player who is gifted Loki and Elsa season passes, so a free-to-play player with two season pass cards, um, and has decided to make a Sand Thanos deck. Uh, THS is like the king of Thanos Lockjaw, so this is like not unsurprisingly a Thanos Lockjaw deck. Most of it is fairly um, consistent with what you'd expect to find from that deck, the one major difference being Sandman. Sandman can be ramped into with Wave instead of Psylocke, because... You want to be able to wave into a six sometimes. So it can be ramped into with wave, or it can be ramped into with the time stone, or it can just pop out of Lockjaw. This is an extremely high value Lockjaw deck, but not necessarily only one. Um, I really like the new wave with Lockjaw, by the way, because on turn five, you can wave, five power is not nothing, and along with wave, you can throw a card into Lockjaw. That lets Lockjaw be more viable on turn four. At that point, you will also be able to play your Magneto, your one of your big sixes, or Devil Dine, or whatever, for four, and then throw a stone or throw a Jeff or whatever into Lockjaw for another roll at a big card. I think that's a really cool change. Uh, I am, I understand why America Chavez isn't in this deck, but America Chavez just got a huge buff and probably needs to be in this deck. America Chavez as a nine power that could come out for free from Lockjaw with no Shang-Chi is going to be too good. Straight up, just going to be too good. All right, Jeff can be a Nightcrawler. This is a Thanos deck, and I would consider Alioth and America. I don't know where I'd put them, in all honesty, but I think that they're probably too good to just ignore. Uh, this is a top four player in the game. This was the number four deck when it hit infinite. It's probably fallen a bit since then. But this is a player who comes at the top of major tournaments all the freaking time. So turn one, priorities draw. Turn two, priorities draw. Turn three, uh, sorry, if your draw is the Mind Stone, you at least consider snapping. I don't think you snap as much. That's in that situation, but fairly often you do, uh, especially on ladder. Turn two is draw is better than Jeff. Turn three, lock draw is my absolute priority unless I know I need to Sandman. If they're playing a bounce deck, I will get Sandman out on four. I will play a ramp card over it. Um, if not, I'm usually snapping in lock draw. 
I will snap on Lockjaw or Sandman here. Um, turn four Sandman, or just start throwing your stuff into Lockjaw. You would still happily get Lockjaw out on turn four over other plays, especially with Wave in the deck because we went over that Wave play earlier. Vision, um, Devil Dino are your main fives, and you can go into Lockjaw um, ideally with playing Wave. And finally, you pick the right dig on the last turn, and then you throw another card into Lockjaw. Seems good. I think this deck is really good. I'm going to figure out how to fit America in here. Why? All right, let's take a look at some variants. This is a one, two, three, four, five hip deck. We're having a really hip heavy day. No ugly base art in this. We've got Jeff, Lockjaw, Wave, Doom, and my new Magneto. I actually like the white Magneto better than this one, but this uh, hip Magneto is new, so I'm throwing it into decks for now. We've got Cozy Devil Dino, my, as always, Art Adam Shang-Chi. And I need the hip wasp, but for now, running the uh, steampunk one is perfectly fine. Hate Sand Sandman. Emperor Doom, best Doom, still in the deck. Best Thanos in the deck, because it just feels so perfect for the character. And the Odin they gave us for Conquest a couple seasons ago. Honestly, uh, someone said this feels really similar to base Odin, and now I can't get that out of my head. So I like it, but I don't love it. I'd really like the hip Odin. Hopefully I see that soon. Nine power cards. All right, so the I think the biggest beneficiary is America Chavez. I think this pushes America Chavez's value through the roof. You don't want her to have 10 power because then, like, she demands the Shang. Like, but America Chavez in various decks as a card you can play that is unshangable, nine is still a lot, is going to be really good. Living Tribunal is a card that's able to come out early. That is a huge bump for the uh, Hella Tribunal to style decks. Like, just... That Iron Man Tribunal um, Onslaught playline was always strong, but it had to be in the right order of tri Tribunal last because Chang Chi was a card. And now you don't. Chang Chi for that deck is just not a card. It doesn't exist. Um, you have Black Cat and the Shard from Black Knight, which both get a big old buff because if you're running Black Knight in a um, Black Cat deck, you're very often going to have a nine power shard. And having two, uh, having a. Um, Nine for three, because Zabu is often in these decks that can't get shang chi is going to be sick. If you'd like a deck for this, by the way, check out yesterday's video. Um, I, you'd probably add Blackout to it at this point. But check out yesterday's video. Yeah, that deck is going to be great right now. Both Black Cat and Black Knight get a big bump. Next up, we also have Abomination, um, particularly Evolved Abomination, but Abomination in general. If Luke Cage is out of the meta and... I don't know about y'all, but I'm seeing significantly less Luke Cage than some of Flick stuff. Getting out a nice, cheap 9-power Abomination can lock up a lane nice and early and let you have the time to alley off our whole late game and win that. That's going to be incredibly strong. Werewolf by Night is an odd number card. It goes 3, 5, 7, 9. So if you can keep it at 9 until the last turn of the game, your opponent's going to have to guess right. And if they have priority, they straight up cannot kill Werewolf. I didn't think Werewolf was going to get nerfed. I think this might change my perspective. Devil Dino often sits at 9 power until you draw some cards. It's a way to protect him, and Devil Dino obviously goes with Royal. Maximus and Surfer is a reasonably big buff here. Um, I've lost a lot of Surfer games by buffing Maximus too high. They shang it, and all of a sudden I lose the lane I was really counting on. There's nothing to really do about that in Surfer sometimes, too. Well... Maximus is back to being really, really great in Surfer um, and loses that downside. And you would think that the same would be true of Gladiator, but this is really bad for Gladiator, in my opinion, because there used to be only one cost that Gladiator couldn't kill that Shang could. Sorry, that, sh that Shang couldn't. So now there's two. There's eight and nine cost cards. If Gladiator pulls an eight and nine cost card, and remember, America Chavez is often in decks, and with any kind of shuffling is very often at the top of decks, Gladiator is going to say, I am a 3-7, and now I just gave them a free 6-9. Oops. You can you can tie that with Surfer, but that's not exactly where you want to be, right? You don't want your 3-7 to automatically make itself a negative 2 power card. Um, I think this really, really hurts Gladiator. However, both Onslaught and Spectrum get a buff. Um, Onslaught with Blue Marvel in particular, Spectrum with like a double buff, or... Um, Spectrum buffs onslaughts, which is, happens in var through various means. All of this, these cards end up nine power, and saying mm, that nine power can't be killed is awesome. 
Nebula that no one plays into ends up at nine, usually. Um, Bishop, Wolfsbane, a bunch of these little growy cards often end up at like eight, nine power, and you're trying to like play this finicky game to keep them right there and not push them too high. Well, that just got easier by an awful lot. Um, and finally, the big winner. I think Rescue is now a phenomenal card. I don't know if you've no all noticed this, but this is a Professor X meta and a half. And Rescue in that deck is going to be stellar. That is now a 12 power lane with nothing else, which is just going to win a lot on turn 4 or 5. Your opponent knows you're going to play there. It's really hard for them to choose. If you think that they're going to try and counter your Professor X with an even bigger play there, you can play a couple small cards and get just a ton of power on the board and really mess up their placement. It's going to be very, very good. If you've got a Zabu out and you can have a Ms. Marvel there, your 12 power lane is now an 18 power lane and like you want it, right? Like, and now you know what card wins you the game in all likelihood in one of the other lanes? Alley off. Feel free to make that deck. Enjoy. You're welcome. Next up, we have Z's deck. I am having a blast with this deck. I haven't had a ton of time to play, but I think it's super fun. So basically, you want to get, like, this is another Gene deck. Um, and you just sort of want to get Gene out and ruin their life, right? You want to get Gene out and make them play into your Echo or Cosmo. And then you want to fill that lane, use Ms. Marvel, use Professor X, use Spectrum, use Orca, and just have too much power in other spots for them to handle. This has America for consistency. So many of these decks lack America, and it's starting to drive me crazy. Um, America is great in this kind of deck, especially if you're running cards you really want to see on curve, like Gene, uh, Ms. Marvel, and Professor X. Even Echo in this instance. All of that's amazing. Echo or Jeff can be Nightcrawler and Scorpion, and you're going to need Gene in. Ms. Marvel Girl, and all early plays should be mid. So Echo is better than Atman, in my opinion, and if you Echo, then I want to play Mojo, because I want to get power in that lane, and if I'm Atman, I want a Jeff. If I have Jean, I'm snapping, playing her mid. If not, I'm playing Cosmo, often mid still if I'm planning to Ms. Marvel mid. If not, I'm happy to do that on the sides. Turn four. Um, Ms. Marvel, I prefer to Jean Grey, who I prefer to Cosmo. Ooh, I just had a thought. Uh, and Professor X in the side lane or Claw mid. You can also Claw to the left to sort of pump that mid lane that you're already bu using to buff everywhere else. And then you decide between Orca and Spectrum. And you do so basically like earlier by counting. We're going to actually go back uh, to that Magneto, to this deck. All the way back here now. See this deck? Magneto is stellar against Ms. Marvel. The reason for is can't be in one lane. Magneto says, but they're going to be. And that should win you a lot of games of snap. Sorry, I don't know why, as I was talking, that occurred to me. But yeah, this is where we are. This deck should be really good. Um, we just talked all about this one. So let's do some quick variant talk. We are hip light here. We are only at two hips. We were doing so well. I decided to use Ugly Mojo in this because he's doing ugly things. I got sick using the same Ant-Man, so I have a little running from bullets Ant-Man. Um, Baby Professor X is the best, so I threw Baby America in there to be friends. Uh, I bought this Orca recently. I think it's great. Cosmo underwa is underwater because Orca's in the deck and Jeff is in the deck. And now they're all friends who can play underwater. How cute. Shop time. First, this is my daily shop. Um, I decided not to buy the Ryan Gonzalez Ms. Marvel. I want the hip. I like the hip better. No offense to Ron, obviously. But I like the hip better. And they're giving us a really, really great free one. So, like, I don't really, like, if the uh, Rion was 700, like the Ms. Marvel is, or, like, free, like the, um, is this Jacinto? It might be Jacinto. Like the uh, Season Pass one is, I would grab it, but it's almost double that, so I decided not to. I did buy this really cool hip Falcon, and now my uh, Steampunk Falcon is likely retired. Thank you for coming. We have a... Um, I have a hip leader. I have a hip warlock, so I'm not buying variants for them. I have hip debris, so I'm not buying a variant. Thing is one of the last 14 cards that I need a variant for, but I don't want a thing that doesn't feel like the thing. I don't want fear itself possessed thing. I want the real thing. So, yeah, I want the real thing. I want the actual Ben Grimm, like, fully in control of facilities thing. So if I see a good one of those, I keep seeing the fear itself variant. If I see a good one of those, I'm buying it. And I decided not to spend 1200 on this really gorgeous hood. Because I have Noir Hood, and Noir is my second favorite type of ARP. And I decided, and I was never going to buy this Crossbones, because Noir Crossbones is also way better. 
Next up, we have this mystery pack. It's 20 bucks for 1,100 gold, which is a little less than you would generally get from 20 bucks. But when you add in 500 credits and two not cannot be pixel variants, I'm pretty happy. So I opened it. I got this Hawkeye and this Forge. Longtime viewers will know that I had the Mechanic Forge, and I hate the Mechanic Forge. Um, I've been running it forever, saying, give me another Forge, give me another Forge, give me another Forge. I now have another Forge. I am happy. That alone is worth my 20 bucks. Um, I also got this Hawkeye. That's fine. I've got a hip, so I don't really care. I can You can give me every Hawkeye on Earth. I really love the hip. I have the um, Avatar Infinite bordered on there. Uh, as I was opening some caches, I got the hip destroyer. You love to see it. This is now I'm perfectly happy with my destroyer. Like I'll never use another one. We're done here. And I bought the Peach Moko She-Hulk bundle just because this is the best She-Hulk in the game. It's hard for me to imagine a better She-Hulk ever coming. I love it. I'm happy. It's already old. Yeah. That's it for today. Thanks for watching. Peace, everybody. Hope you had a great time. Sub, ring the bell. Don't miss out. More videos to come.